For Criminal Media's Polity, I'm Tabi Madiba. Author Dr. McLean Sibanda discusses his book titled Nuts and Bolts, Strengthening Africa's Innovation and Entrepreneur Ecosystems. Your book provides practical insights on innovation and entrepreneurship for Africa's development through a narrative of your seven years of repositioning Sub-Saharan Africa's first internationally recognized science and technology park, the Innovation Hub. So briefly take us through your journey to the success of the Innovation Hub. Yeah, so thank you very much. So I started off uh, in February 2011 uh, as a CEO of the Innovation Hub. Uh, prior to that, I was uh, with the Technology Innovation Agency uh, as a group executive for commercialization. And interestingly, we're located in the same uh, park uh, in one of the buildings at the Innovation Hub, and yet I didn't know much about what was going on at the Innovation Hub. And then before that, I was with the predecessor to TIA, which was the Innovation Fund. Uh, and so when I got hired, uh, the mandate that I was given by the board uh, and also the shareholder, the Heart and Growth and Development Agency, was to reposition the innovation hub uh, to focus on innovation. Now, the innovation hub had been set up uh, in about 2001 uh, to 2005. They were building up the infrastructure. And then from 2005 up to the time that I joined, it was in essence scaling up the programs that had been run when it was uh, incubated itself at the, at the CSIR. And so coming in, I looked uh, at uh, what uh, was on offer. In essence, there was an incubator that was incubating uh, less than eight uh, startups. And then there were a program such as Coach Lab that were working with industry as well as the universities uh, to upskill you know, young people. And then I looked at the staff complement uh, and in the book I'm going to detail around that, that none of the people had a science or technology degree. And yet the innovation hub was meant to be a science and technology park. And so the first uh, thing that one had to do is get to the board and ask, whether we can actually look at the staff complement and focus more on skills, in essence, that were required to take the innovation hub forward. And then part of that was then also deciding what are we going to focus on? Uh, and so we chose to then focus uh, on green economy, bioeconomy, as well as smart industries, and uh, also looked at the tenancy, which had declined uh, in the in you know in the two months uh, that I started you know to just below fifty percent, uh, and in the book I talk about uh, in essence how uh, you know leaders need to uh, regain the confidence of their stakeholders and how we manage to do that at the innovation hub. And can you explain to us why incubators and entrepreneurship programs fail? Well, many fell for a number of reasons. So, I mean, the programs themselves failed, you know, you know partly uh, because the people that run these particular programs have never sold anything. So then they're, they're not entrepreneurs themselves. They don't understand the journey of entrepreneurs. Uh, and quite often it's a tick box exercise. And in the book, I talk about that, that there is a need for anyone that's getting into entrepreneurship as a support to make sure that they understand how entrepreneurs uh, you know feel uh, so get out sell something uh, you know cut someone's hair make some some money chase some money understand how difficult it is for entrepreneurs to actually survive you know out there uh, and so that is the one thing that uh, you know really looking at a capacity you know problem and capacity issue and uh, the support uh, systems not being able to understand the journey of an entrepreneur and then obviously there's other issues. Uh, one of them is actually access to market. In the book, we talk about also, you know, access to market. Some of the contributors also, you know, talk about that. There's a need to connect the entrepreneurs uh, to the marketplace. And then let me talk about entrepreneurs, why they fail. You know, some of the entrepreneurs actually fail because they set out to make money. There's nothing wrong with making money. But if your sole purpose in entrepreneurship is making money, you are likely to fail. I think I found that the people that have succeeded the most are people that found something very compelling, a problem, uh, in a something of curiosity and wondered why is this not done this way? Some frustration 
uh, you know, you can take Twilim Tetra in the book who actually experienced crime uh, and went out in essence and set up Memeza as a response uh, to addressing, you know, crime. So I think it's quite important for entrepreneurs to really find a problem that is compelling enough and requires solving and solve that particular problem. And in the process, uh, money will follow. And you mentioned that there were many initiatives and projects that you sought but never succeeded, mainly owing to funding constraints. So what advice can you give to an entrepreneur who faces challenges with accessing funding for developing the underlying business concept? Yeah, so I mean, that's a very important you know, question. And I mean, in the book, I talk about that within the context of obviously the innovation hub uh, being funded by government. And we needed a lot of money to actually put up, for example, the youth plug and play center, which we didn't, uh, you know, uh, do it because there was no money. So I think, you know, for you know, for other people setting up these things, it's important to integrate, you know, with industry. But now coming to the entrepreneurs themselves, access to funding is often cited as being the biggest reason for their failure, and often the biggest reason why entrepreneurs do not start. And my advice to any entrepreneur is uh, don't let access to funding be a problem. What is important is for the entrepreneur to understand what problem they're solving. Forget about the business plan. Take a one page and in essence start to work on a business model canvas. What is your value proposition? Who are the customers? And how are you connecting that value proposition to the customers? How are you going to make money? How are you going to maintain the relationship with the customers? What are your costs? Uh, and uh, those costs relate to what are you actually going to be doing on a day-to-day -day basis to deliver that value proposition? What resources do you require as a business to deliver on that value proposition? And what strategic partners do you need? That, those nine elements, uh, Tabi, make up, in essence, the, the core of any business. So once an entrepreneur has done that, I would then say, take it to the next level, which is uh, start to work on a minimum viable product or a pilot where you test the idea and see whether the idea works. Uh, and once uh, you've tested the idea on a small population or a few people, you then develop customers, sell the product, sell something, sell the service to a number of people, uh, and shift from I am going to do this to saying I have done this. So when you go and have conversations with funders, you are saying I have done this and this is a proof that this is something that the market will accept uh, and you find that it becomes much easier to actually fund the business. So customers are probably the best way of funding uh, you know, any business. And talk to us more about your leadership style and how you tackle challenges coming your way? So leadership uh, is about people. Uh, and quite often as leaders, we forget uh, that uh, it's about people. And in the book, I talk about my own obsession with results, uh, which uh, at, you know, at times uh, really cost me uh, up until I realized that um, I was honored to have men and women waking up every morning, getting into their cars, uh, or whatever means of transport, getting through the doors and the gates of the innovation hub and coming in to work to support me and the executive team to deliver on the promises that we'd made to the people of Houteng. And so that became a sobering moment, you know, for me. Uh, and, uh, you know, it reminded me in essence uh, of uh, Moses, uh, and the lessons that one can learn from Moses in the Bible around, you know, leadership that, you know, to lead, uh, it means that to serve. And therefore, it's important, uh, in essence, to, um, uh, you know, to really listen to the people that you're leading, understand why they're not delivering results, and support them as much as possible. Now, reflecting on that, you uh, know, servant wood uh, is really what leadership is about. Uh, and I've learned uh, that one needs to consult, uh, you need to be an inclusive you know, leader, but at the end of the day, one has got to take a decision. Uh, and so I've been quite decisive when a decision is going to be made. I learned that one has to make a decision uh, and you, you stand by that decision. You may make mistakes and we did make mistakes, I did make mistakes, 
but you come back to people and apologize and people will forgive you if they understand that you were leading from the heart uh, and you had their best interest at heart. And tell us more about the Lab initiative and what impact did the initiative have on the youth and communities at large? So, you know, when I started off, uh, one of the things that we realized was that, um, you know, the Innovation Hub was not really, you know, inclusive. It didn't represent the demographics of the province. You know, many young people living in the townships were left out because they needed to get uh, three, four, five taxis uh, to get uh, to the Innovation Hub in Pretoria. Uh, and uh, when they get there, uh, they didn't really know where to start. Uh, and so we, we wanted to, to really implement the vision that was espoused in the innovation uh, strategy of Gauteng of 2012 of inclusive uh, innovation. Uh, and so we partnered with the city of uh, Tswane, found one of their uh, sites, the Arts and Culture Center in Harangoa, and then set up this, re really redid uh, the design inside, put up desks, put up high-speed bandwidth, and put up uh, you know, other prototyping uh, equipment uh, for young people, in essence, to catch one taxi or two taxis and be in a facility which had same level of service as they would get if they went uh, to the Innovation Hub uh, in uh, Pretoria. And so that was in essence the birth uh, of uh, Ekasi Lab, uh, which was taking innovation to the people. Uh, and, uh, and, 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 and following that very first one, we then went on to set up you know, nine others. By the time I left in 2018, there were 10 Ekasi Labs uh, throughout uh, the five regions of Gauteng, and they were supporting over 400 uh, startups. Uh, and many of those have gone on uh, to build big businesses. In the book, I think there's about two or three that share their own story and the journey and what Ekasi Lab meant uh, you know, for them. And I think quite importantly was also looking forward into the future and saying, what kind of jobs are the youth of the future going to require? And we set up something called Code Tribe, which is a software coding academy. Had a number of these uh, Ekasi Labs, and they're still running. Uh, you know, over a period, two year period, that uh, you know trained and graduated over 200 young people in employment, and some of them have started off their own businesses uh, in software coding. So it's actually quite, you know, when the president announced recently, uh, you know, that uh, software coding was going to be a, a subject uh, for primary schools, I was actually one of the happy you know, people because we need to empower our youth uh, for the future. And the fourth revolution is starting to be seen as the new normal. So is there a fundamental need for government structures, including regulations and legislations to adapt to, to this new wave? You know, absolutely. I think quite often we regulate, we over-regulate. Uh, and I think in this particular case, I would say that what we need to do is look at the policies and the regulations that we have in place and say, are they enabling? So let's look at the issue of the spectrum. How do we free up more spectrum? How do we allow young people to have access to data that government collects? Um, and I think we're seeing it now with COVID-19, how important data is because you can predict uh, the trends. You can see what is going to you know, happen in the future uh, and give young people access to this data and let them come up with innovative uh, you know, solutions uh, to address many of the problems that uh, might be you know, out there. Uh, and so I think with the fourth industrial revolution, what is actually quite important uh, is in essence, um, also the issues around connectivity. How do we make sure that uh, there is uh, connectivity that is accessible uh, and, uh, and affordable? Uh, because, uh, you know, so those are some of the issues that we need to really be dealing with. Mm -hmm. And can the huge shifts in our way of working and living as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic pave the way for a more innovative and cost-effective way of doing things? So absolutely, I think more innovative for sure, because uh, this is a, a journey that none of us have walked, and therefore we're actually having to learn uh, and adapt. And that is in essence where innovation comes in, that ability to be able to, uh, you know, to adapt. 
But also having said that, uh, there are also challenges because our society is not an equal society. Not everyone has got access to connectivity. You and I can sit here and have a conversation, uh, but many people uh, cannot afford you know, to do that. Either the cost of the data is too high or the device that they have is not uh, ideal for, you know, for that. Uh, so, I mean, one of the students that I'm supervising has been writing his dissertation, a master's dissertation, on a phone. And you can imagine the difficulty around formatting and all sorts of things. And so I'll say that what we need to be actually looking at is how can we uh, empower uh, people and making it easier for people to, uh, to make these shifts uh, to working virtually, learning virtually. Can we reduce the cost of data uh, that is one thing can we reduce the cost of devices can we start to make devices in south africa so promote a, a maker uh, you know economy uh, so that more and more people can access devices and be connected but yet at the same time we need to look at um, uh, building uh, certain habits and making sure that people do not get burnt out because working virtually or learning virtually does not mean that it's necessarily easier. You know, quite often what you've seen is that you actually work harder than when one is actually, you know, in the office. But I think it's quite important for us to make these shifts so that we are not left behind. Uh, we miss the first industrial revolution, we miss the second one. The third one, we almost caught it. I think the fourth industrial revolution we have a chance. And so it's really incumbent on our government to say, uh, do we have enabling policies, but also for industry to come on board and say, can we provide opportunities uh, to, uh, to innovate and get on onto the bend uh, wagon of the fourth industrial revolution. And lastly, what are you hoping people take away after reading your book? So the book is written for, uh, for a number of readers. I'd say that uh, three or four readers is written for people that are just curious about what, what's this innovation, what's this entrepreneurship. I think those people would be able to get a better understanding of, uh, you know, of, of the, the, the whole topic around uh, the entrepreneurship being, in essence, the future, entrepreneurship being um, you know, providing a pathway for an alternative way of doing things, uh, you know, into the, uh, into the future. So those people, I hope they will be inspired uh, by the stories and the insights that are contained in the, in, the, in the book, because it's real people that they can relate with. It's products that they see in the shops uh, that they can see in the social media. Uh, the second type is really uh, the leader. I think, you know, for leaders, I'm hoping that uh, they will be able to uh, take away, uh, in essence, you know, the lessons from our own journey uh, of uh, repositioning an organization, the challenges that one faces, and also realizing that uh, you will be attacked. Uh, not everyone is going to like what you're going to do, but I think it's quite important for one to lead, you know, from the heart. And I think thirdly to the entrepreneurs, uh, the stories of the entrepreneurs that are contained in this book are really you know, great. I think they inspire, they give hope, they give evidence uh, that uh, you know, with a, a vision and the support, you can make a difference to society, you can make a difference to your family and also to yourself. Uh, and the book is in essence a toolbox that uh, those entrepreneurs can go back and refer to from time to time. And then lastly, uh, you know, the fourth category is uh, to the policymakers and people that support entrepreneurs. I hope that it empowers them to actually understand what this journey is all about. Uh, and also, I mean, the, you know, the various entrepreneurs talk about what they expect you know, from incubators. I mean, uh, you know, Basica talks about, you know, resources, networking, you know, belonging, uh, you know, ment mentorship, exposure, market access support, as well as uh, how incubators give them legitimacy uh, when they go and talk to, uh, whether it's government officials or whether it's, um, you know, uh, captains of industry. And I'm hoping that it will really empower them to properly reposition their support and also to the people in uh, the policy makers to actually understand the implications of the policies that they make. And hopefully it will inspire some of them to make the jump 
uh, towards entrepreneurship uh, and uh, start to create you know, more jobs for our economy. That was Dr. McLean Sibanda speaking to Prima Media's polity about nuts and bolts.